Continuing a sermon series based upon the life of Moses entitled Walking by Faith. And today we're kind of going out of chronological order a little bit, just because I thought today's scripture lesson spoke more to, to Stephen Ministry Sunday and how all of us have gifts and talents that God calls us to give back, not only for the body of Christ, but to uplift those not in the body of Christ. So again, we're going to go out of chronological order a little bit, kind of, kind of like the, the Star Wars movies where, you know, George Lucas started with episodes four, five, and six, and then he went back and made episodes one, two, and three, and now it seems like every year they come out with a new episode, and, and I, even I, and I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but even I sometimes, sometimes have a hard time figuring out whether, um, what, where exactly in the Star Wars universe this, uh, this movie is taking place. I even saw where next month they're, they're releasing a Han Solo movie about Han Solo in his early years and how he became a smuggler. Well, hopefully the sermon this morning in the context is not as complicated as the Star Wars universe and trying to figure out what's a sequel and prequel. Um, but we are going out of chrono chronological order just a little bit. Last Sunday, Pastor, Pastor Sarah did a great job with Moses in the, in the burning bush. Well, today we are. We're skipping forward to the people of Israel and Moses as they begin their journey through the wilderness. So we're kind of skipping over the, their escape from Egypt. They've already crossed the, the Red Sea. And now, now they're just beginning their journey in the wilderness. And, and in the next few weeks, we'll kind of go back and fill in the gaps. But today... Today we're starting with them in the wilderness. Our text comes to us from the book of Exodus, chapter 18, and I want to read to you verses 13 through 23. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law, who is Jethro, saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and his, and his instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men, who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, and the meditation of all, of all the hearts, souls, and minds gathered in this place, be acceptable unto thee, O God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. So again, the context of our scripture lesson this morning, Moses and the people of Israel are just starting out on their 40-year journey, that's right, 40-year journey, are wandering in the wilderness. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of the people of Israel escaping Egypt, and now they find themselves in the wilderness trying to survive. For me, it's almost mind-boggling. For me, it's almost unimaginable. Now, if you remember, when they first went to, uh, when they first went to Egypt, because there was a, a famine in their own land in Canaan, 
And by the way, when, when I say Israel, the Hebrews, the Jews, all the same people. Those names, interchangeable for God's special people. But when the Israelites first went to Egypt, they were led by the patriarch Jacob, whose name would be later changed to Israel. But they're led by their patriarch Jacob, and as they went to Egypt because of the famine in their land, does anybody know how many there were originally? Seventy. You were in first service. Good job, Scott. I appreciate that. There were 70. We're told that there were 70 Israelites when they went to Egypt in the beginning. But we are also told in the Bible they were there for 430 years. And over those 430 years, God blessed them. And the Bible says they were exceedingly fruitful and multiplied greatly. They were exceedingly fruitful and multiplied greatly. That's all I'll say about that. (laughs) So much so that they became a threat to Pharaoh and to the nation of Egypt. That's why they had to escape. And when they escaped, we are told that there were 600,000 men on foot. Many scholars believe that these were the the fighting men. That's what it means by on foot. So there were 600,000 fighting men in addition to the women, to the children, to the old men. In the book of Exodus, chapter 12, 38, it also tells us that many other people went up with them. So these are those Egyptians who saw what their God was doing, and they were like, hey, we, we want to follow that God. The God who's performing all of these miracles. We want to be with him. Many scholars, when they look at these numbers and add them all up, a lot of them believe that there were more than 2 million people leaving Egypt within the body of Israel. And I'm not good with math, but I've seen the numbers, and it is possible (laughs) to go from 70 to more than 2 million in 430 years, especially if God blesses you and you're exceedingly fruitful and multiplied greatly. (laughs) But imagine that for just a moment. More than 2 million people leaving Egypt at the same time. To put that into context, that's about the size of Houston, Texas. Current World Series champions, thank you very much. Go Astros. It's about the population of Houston, the fourth largest city in the United States. And all of a sudden we are told that all of these people at once have left Egypt. Now, if you're Moses and you're watching all this, I mean, how intimidated must, intimidating must that have been for Moses? I'm sure Moses is thinking, how in the world am I going to lead all of these people? I mean, it is almost mind-boggling. How do you do that? How do you deal with all the, all the details that it will take to move two million people in one direction? Remember, they didn't, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have GPS systems. You know, today, you just send out an email to everybody. Hey, here's the Google map. Follow it. If you get lost, just call me. They didn't have any of that. And so Moses has to try and figure out how we're going to do this. And it takes takes him some time. I mean, eventually, he's going to divide them up into 12 tribes, right? And he's going to assign certain uh, community living aspects to to each tribe. He's going to give them responsibilities. God's going to lead them. At night, he's going to put a big pillar of fire, right? They don't need a GPS. God's going to lead them with a fire, a pillar of fire. And in the day, a a great cloud to, to lead them. But Moses is just trying to figure this out. And in our text this morning, he's trying to be the judge and jury for all of them, for the entire nation. And his father-in-law, Jethro, sees this. He's like, what in the world are you doing? 
Let me give you some advice. You don't have to do it all. Find some good people. Make them judges. Yeah, if there's a really difficult case that'll come to you, but everything else, leave it to them. You can't do it all yourself. If you try, you're going to wear yourself out, and everybody's going to be mad at you. Jethro, lending a hand to his his father-in-law. A father-in-law who who needs it. I mean, the the responsibility placed on Moses. I mean, my goodness, last Sunday, um, two of my, my girls, Olivia and Gabby, were, were out with friends. Olivia, or Emma's down in Indianapolis at college, so it was just the three of us after church last Sunday, Marianne, uh, Luke, and I. And since it was just the three of us, we decided, hey, let's go out to eat. <laughs> but it took us a half an hour to figure out where we wanted to go. You ever have that problem? It was just the three of us. Three of us took us a half an hour. Luke wanted to go to Noodles and Company, and we're like, if we, if we go, if we're, we're going to eat noodles, we'll just make noodles at home. <laughs> My wife suggested Texas Roadhouse, but I think she said that simply because over Lent I gave up meat, and I'm st- I still haven't eaten in, any meat, and I think she's trying to get me back on the whatever it is when you start eating meat again, but, um, but I said, no, I'm not ready to eat meat again. Don't want to go to Texas Roadhouse. So we ended up at Olive Garden. Some of you probably know this, but you know why we went to Olive Garden, or probably can guess this. You're probably like us. Any any guesses? I heard it. Gift card. We had gift cards. I mean, when all things are equal, right, you choose where you got gift cards. We're a family, you know, we're going we're going with the gift card. So if you gave us an Olive Garden gift card within the past year or so, thank you. We really enjoyed lunch last Sunday. But it took us a half an hour to decide. Moses has two million people he's trying to lead. He cannot do it by himself. And here's Jethro saying that exact thing to him. You need to delegate. Give other people responsibilities. I want to, I just want to pause right there. Jethro. I mean, most of, most of us, if, you know, if you're my age or older, when you think of Jethro, you probably think of the Beverly Hillbillies, right? You, you, I mean, and, the, and then there's the crowd that, the hell, Beverly Hillbillies, who are they? So I, li- I like to picture Jethro like in the Beverly Hillbillies, although Jethro is the son, right? Is that right? Um, I just picture Jethro coming to Moses. I, don't, <laughs> I realize he's older, but... Uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, comes to him. And remember from last week, Pastor Sarah mentioned it, Jethro is not an Israelite. Jethro is a Midianite. Jethro is a foreigner lending a hand to Moses. And it just got me thinking this past week of Moses' life and all the foreigners who reached out a hand to help him. When he was in that papyrus basket as a baby, it was Pharaoh's daughter who reached out a hand and saved him. Going against, by the way, going against her father's orders. She was putting her own life at risk to save this Hebrew baby. And believe me, she knew that it was a Hebrew baby. That she risked her life to save Moses. In our text, we have Jethro, again, a Midianite, a foreigner, lending a hand to assist Jethro in a godly way. In Exodus chapter 4, and I'm not really going to go into this. You don't hear a lot of pastors preach on Exodus chapter 4. And by the way, you can look it up yourself. Um, I'm not going to go into it. It's just, you'll see. It's Exodus 4, Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. Or you find yourself nodding off in the last part of this sermon. Just look it up. It'll wake you up. Um, Exodus 4, 24 through 26. In that passage, and it doesn't tell us why necessarily, but it, it says the Lord is about to kill Moses. Exodus chapter 4. The Lord is about to kill Moses. And it's his wife, Zipporah, 
a Midianite, a foreigner, who saves him. So time and time again in the life of Moses, it's a foreigner who assists him, who saves him, who lends a hand to him, reaching out to him. And again, throughout the sermon series, we're going to see how Moses was a, a foreshadowing of Jesus. And even in Jesus' life, we see foreigners coming in to, to help him. Remember the magi, the wise men, the foreigners who come, and they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, surely thereafter, the, the holy family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they have to leave Israel, and where do they go? They go to Egypt. Again, this intertwining of Moses and Jesus, they go to Egypt, because Herod is about to kill all of the baby boys back in Israel. And how do they sustain themselves? How are they going to live as foreigners in a foreign land? You go back to the magi, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. What we will discover is that Israel's time in Egypt and then, and then the Exodus really shapes the entire story. It shapes the Bible from God's point of view. In Deuteronomy 10, 19, we are told, And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And then in Galatians 3, 28, Paul says, Faith in Christ Jesus is what makes each of you equal with each other. Whether you are a Jew or a Greek, a slave or a free person, a man or a woman. And so in God's eyes, when God looks at us, he doesn't look at the color of our skin. He doesn't look at our nationality. We are all equal in the eyes of God. As I, as I look at our text this morning, there's just a couple things that, that strike me couple ways we can apply, apply this to our lives, and I, th I think they go hand in hand. The first thing is, is this. Who, who's the stranger? Who's the foreigner in, in your life that God's calling you to love, that God's calling you to, to reach out a hand to? And it's one of those things that when you open your eyes, God will bring that person into your life, the stranger, the, the foreigner, maybe that person who's never heard of Christ. Maybe that's how they're a stranger to you, that they are unchurched. But who's the stranger, who's the foreigner God's placing in your life that you're called to love, that you're called to, to lend a hand to? And the second thing about this is this. Just as Moses couldn't do it by himself, neither can we in the church do it by ourselves as individuals. It takes all of us. It takes all of us to be the body of Christ. Some of us are hands. Some of us are feet. I think I've mentioned this before, but I just love it. One pastor said that she was the stomach acid to, to the body of Christ. That person that just stirs things up. Because every now and then you need someone to stir things up. When you become complacent, you need someone to stir things up. And so she saw herself as the stomach acid to the body of Jesus Christ. But it takes all of us. You know, our mission as a church is to make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. If we are going to transform the world, it will take all of us. It will take the entire body. Being ambassadors for Jesus Christ. The hands and the feet and the voice. We are called to work, to work together. And so what are the gifts and talents that God has given to you that you are called to share? Maybe, maybe it is being a part of the Stephen ministry. Maybe it's just being a prayer warrior for Christ. Maybe it's being someone who on a, on a Sunday morning, you want to be a part of, of a team that welcomes people into this place. You know, typically every, every Sunday, I'm, I'm the first person to arrive. Tip, typically, I'm the first person to arrive. I just like to get centered, just to pray for the, you know, the doorposts as people will enter later on that morning. But the second person to arrive, he gets here at about 7.15 every Sunday. If I'm not here, he's the one that unlocks the doors for you, and you probably don't even know that. But do you know, do you know why he gets here at 7.15? To 
prepare the coffee. So that when people come, either after first service or before second service, he comes to prepare the coffee. He doesn't get paid for it. <laughs> he does it, well, he, he said to me, he said he does it because, you know, I don't sleep real well. I might as well be doing something. But it's Bill Watson. If you ever get, if you ever get coffee, Bill Wath, Watson's in there. Tell him, tell him thank you. You know, we're beginning this, this thing where on the second Sundays of the month we're having Rise and Roll Donuts. I love Rise and Roll Donuts. But here's the thing. The purpose of having Rise and Roll Donuts isn't necessar- is not necessarily for us to have a better experience on Sunday morning. That's not the reason. That's not the purpose. Have a donut, please. I mean, don't get me wrong. Have a donut. But here's the purpose. The purpose is so that you, in a non-threatening way, can go to a neighbor or a friend or a coworker or a family member and say, hey, on the second Sundays we're having rise and roll. If you want to come, I'll meet you at the door. I'll, I'll bring you. You can have a donut, some coffee. If you want to stay for church, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Or if you're in there and you've got your donut and your cup of coffee and you see someone sitting by themselves, this is not high school. This is not junior high. This is the one body of Jesus Christ. Sit with them. Sit with, get to know them a little better. The donuts, the purpose is relationships and nurturing them. Invite some. We are the one body of Jesus Christ. And we all have gifts and talents that God is calling us to share. And we need all of them if we're truly going to transform the world. So two things this morning, two things I want you to pray about. Who's the stranger? Who's the foreigner? That God's calling you to lend a hand to, to, to love, to reach out to to maybe invite them to church for a donut. (laughs) So pray about that and then pray the gifts and talents you can use. If it's just prayer, I don't want to say just prayer, but, but maybe because of physicality, you can pray, but maybe nothing else. Well, we need prayer warriors, let me tell you. Who's the, who's the, the, the foreigner, the, the, the stranger that God's calling you to? What are your gifts and talents that God is asking you to serve his kingdom? Would you please pray with me? Most gracious God, we do, do thank you for this day. We thank you for our Stephen ministers and for the gifts and talents that you've given to them. But dear God, we also realize that each and every one of us here this morning have been given gifts and talents. Maybe it's to serve on a Sunday morning by making coffee. (laughs) Maybe it's by simply going to a neighbor and asking them if there's anything you can do for them. Maybe it's sitting down every day and just praying praying for that son, that daughter, that parent who doesn't know the Lord. And you become a prayer warrior for them. Just speak to us, O oh God. Open our eyes to the stranger. Open our eyes to, eyes to our gifts and talents that we can use for your sake and for your kingdom. We just love you. We love your scriptures, Moses. Thank you for Jethro and for the other foreigners in Moses' life who assist him. Thank you for the wise men. We thank you that we are not seen as foreigners in the body of Christ, even though we're not 
Israelites. We have been grafted into the family, and we thank you for that. May your spirit just go with us this morning into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song? Thank you.